everybody, Steve from Steve's Makerspace. We are in P5JS and I have made this thing. It's flow packing. I had my rectangle packing uh, program from before. I've added a bunch of stuff to it. I've added a user interface and it's making some amazing stuff. Some changes I made for my rectangle packing code. I added these pedals plus a few circles, optimized the packing, added more areas of rotation, uh, added some circles, added a bunch of tree assets, I uh, layers to the background, I tweaked the background color, I added randomness for all these variables, and I added the user interface, and I also have this greeniness button, which I'll show you in a minute. Let me show you how to play with this. There is a link to this code in the video description. You can play with this in your browser. Uh, you can click on this new art button and it will generate some new art. You can specify the canvas area. So if you want a smaller canvas, you can do that. Hit new art. And now we have a really tiny canvas. Or you could make a 2000 by 2000 canvas if you want. It will take a about four seconds at least on my machine. Right now it's adding layers, uh, randomness for the tree, adding circles, it's using petals, and the size of the these things are random. I could say that I want small of these, I want rectangles, I don't want any circles, I do want a tree, uh, let's keep the layers and do new art. And there we go. That looks nice. Let's add the circles back, but no tree. And we'll do both petals and rectangles. And let's make them large. New art. All right, that's kind of ugly. Let's try again. That's a little bit better. Now we can save a JPEG if we want. So now we have a JPEG. And this last button is adding graininess to the picture. So after you do the render, you can hit add grain. And let me save that. And we'll zoom in on it a little bit. And you can see that it's added some grainy texture to this. And you can actually hit grain again if you want it even more grainy. And I could hit that like several times and it'll get really grainy. Let's take a look at that. And that's what that looks like. Let's put everything to random and see what we get. Not too bad. Sometimes it puts stuff on the tree. It's got a like a one in 10 chance of putting stuff on the tree. That one looks pretty nice. I like that. So before I get into the code, I know I'm going to lose a few of you. If you've liked this video so far, please give it a like, share with friends, share renders on social media with a link to my YouTube channel and, or my Twitter handle. All right, let's get into the code. So I won't be talking about the rectangle packing or the Pearl and noise or the rotation too much in this video because I've got two other videos where I went over that in detail. Um, I'll leave a link to those videos in the video description. So first let's talk about replacing the rectangles with a curved vertex or this pedal. I did not change the packing algorithm at all. I'm using the rectangle packing algorithm. Uh, so I've got a representation of that here. So you can see that the curved vertex is fitting in where the rectangle would be and the edge of the curved vertex might be up here or might be down here or in the middle uh, depending on the art. So each time there's new art there's a percentage calculated of where this is going to wind up. So now into the code of this thing that I've created. Uh, it used to be that there was just a rectangle here but now it's checking what type of shape it is, or the shape type. And if the shape type is between one and two, then it's going to do a curve vertex like this. This midleaf variable is for that midpoint on the side. There's also the possibility of doing both the rectangles and the petals. And so that shape type, which is three, I think, uh, goes to multiple shapes. So multiple shapes gets called. And in multiple shapes, there's a variable for which type of shape it's going to be. Uh, and there's a possibility not only of a rectangle shape and a curved vertex shape, but also a circle. Now, it's a small possibility because a lot of circles uh, kind of look cool, but they don't do anything for the flow of the piece. I like the rectangles and the curved vertex is better because it adds to the flow, but the circles are nice for a little variety. And I did try making a specific circle packing algorithm and I failed. <laughs> but 
So this is actually still using the rectangle packing algorithm uh, to do the circles. So the second thing to talk about is the optimization of the packing. What I showed before was it checking the points for each side of the rectangle, one side at a time. And I still have that in here, but before I do that, I'm going to check three corners, two sides, and the center before I do all of those other checks. And the fourth corner is the first item checked here. So this is a quick check to see if there's anything interfering with a rectangle going there rather than checking every single point along one side. Let's just check the corners and the center. And if we see a problem with any of that, we can stop before doing all that detail. So that is decreasing the amount of processing we have to do. I went from about four seconds down to three seconds. So it was about a 25% savings in processing. The next thing, centers of rotation. In the rectangle packing program, I had two possible centers of rotation and I gave them percentages of influence. How influential is this center of rotation versus this center of rotation versus the pearl and noise. I decided to dispense with that percentage of influence and I'm just adding up the angles from the pearl and noise and the rotation centers that are coming into play. So the five areas of rotation are the corner like here and another corner over here and the corner down here and the corner down here and then an area in the center. So this is the X and Y of one of those corners and you can see it's going from zero, zero, so this is the top left, to some percentage of the width and some percentage of the height. Then this is calculating a randomness for whether that center of rotation will come into play. Then I should also talk about the circles at this point because they're sort of related. Because the circles are also going to happen at those angles of rotation. Although sometimes you can get an area of rotation and a circle, or you can get an area of rotation but no circle, or you can get a circle but no area of rotation. So this code here is saying whether there's going to be a circle there. Uh, so it's got a 50% chance of making a circle. That's only if add circles equals true. There's some randomness to the circle size. And these two are the top two circles. These are the bottom two circles. And these circles have an extra if statement because if we're going to add a tree, I don't want the bottom circles. If there's no tree there and there's a circle near the bottom, then it looks fine. But once you add the tree, then the human says, oh, that's a moon. And if you got the moon down below the tree, it looks weird. So no low circles if there's a tree. And then I believe this last one is the middle circle. Now let's skip down to the angles. This is the same sort of code for the angle of rotation that I had before. Now we just have more of them, and then we're adding all the angles together. The pearl and noise angle is number one, and then these are the five possible angles of rotation. And this part here is saying uh, whether the angle of rotation is coming into play or not, and if it is, it calculates this angle, and if it's not, then that angle is zero. Next, let's talk about the trees. The tree was a suggestion of Eugene Therapy on the Generative Discord. I have 14 tree assets that I got from Zoli, who posted them on OnlyGFX.com. I wish I could say more about Zoli, but there's no profile information here about that person. There's a link to this in the code. I loaded the tree assets and retitled them 0 through 13. I showed this process before in my pattern making video, but in preload I'm loading the images using this for loop. So uh, loading 14 images and it's assets tree plus string of i, so here's the i, uh, plus dot png. So it loads all 14 of these images. Then down in the code, after we've drawn those large circles, if add tree is true, then pick a tree from those 14 and then we've got a randomness to the place it's either going to be placed on the left or on the right we need to resize the tree based on the canvas size and then i'm calling the draw tree function 
So here's the draw tree function. I maybe didn't need this to be in its own function, but I did it anyway. I think I was thinking I might draw multiple trees and that's why I put it in a function. But this is just saying if the tree is on the left, put it there. If the tree is on the right, put it there. And I had to put the tree a little bit down below the canvas because there was some space below the tree. And as I mentioned before, the tree has about a 10% chance that objects will be drawn onto it. What actually happens is the tree gets drawn and packing happens and items get placed on the tree and then it has a 90% chance of being redrawn at the end. Someone on Twitter suggested that I use some L systems trees and I had thought of that. I do want to do an L system tree. I have not done one before but that's something I want to work on. Next I want to talk about some tweaks I made to the background color so we'll go to the color stuff JS. So before I had two shades of gray background and I had a dark color from the color palette. Now I've added a possibility of a black color for the background but only if the tree is false because the tree is black and I didn't want uh, it to disappear into the background. And then I had this stuff for getting a color from the color palette and making it darker. I moved that to its own function, so I'm calling it up here. So I've got the main make background function, and then I call this color BG function, which is here. So the color BG function, this is the color I was using before with the rectangle packing, but now I've added this color option as well, which is still using the color palette, but it's significantly brighter. And the main reason that I added this was because of the tree. The tree was disappearing. So if there's a tree on the canvas, it won't be using this dark background. Now let's go back to the main sketch and talk about the layers. So if layers equals true, then we're going to push and translate to the center of the canvas. And then we're going to start by rotating the canvas to a random 180 degrees. Then we've got a 75% chance of adding the first layer. Then we're going to rotate 180 degrees. And then we've got a 75% chance of the second layer. So you might have a layer here and here. Or you might have a layer here or here. Or a layer here or here. Then you've got a possibility of a third layer. And this is a random rotation of 180 degrees. And then when we've drawn all our layers, we're going to pop. Now I haven't gone over the actual drawing of the layers yet. You can see it's calling this add layers function. So the add layers function is drawing a giant curve vertex. So the bottom and the sides of the curve vertex are going way off the screen. So you can't see the sides. So all you see is the top edge of the vertex and the middle of it. So there's some randomness to the starting height of the vertex. And there's randomness to how much the vertex is going to go up and down across the canvas. And in order to draw this curved vertex, we're first calling the color BG. So going back here, the color BG is getting a color from the color palette. One option is pretty dark and is not going to get chosen if there's a tree. And the other option is not too dark. So that's basically it for the layers. Next, let's look at the user interface. I made up a separate JavaScript file just for the user interface. So first I've got a create user interface function and this is where all the buttons are created. The radio button, the input for the width and height of the screen. So you can see there's quite a lot here. I'm not going to go into detail about creating regular buttons, but I do want to say a little bit about radio buttons because this was new to me and I don't think people use it very often. And it was a little trickier than I expected. So first off, we create the item and you have to put a name in here in quotes. And this is not necessary if you only have one group of radio items, but if you have multiple groups of radio items like I do, then you need to have this a name in here and make sure it's in quotes. Then we've got an option for each radio button for that group. And you can have a name in there or you can have a radio option that has two parts. This is the part that's going to show up on the canvas. And this is basically an identifier for this option. 
And you can also have a starting selection for the option by doing dot selected. I had some trouble with wraparound for the button options and I wound up putting in a bunch of dots to try to fix the wraparound. I don't know if there's a way around that. If anybody knows, please let me know in the comments. So I think that's enough said about setting up all of these radio options. And then I've got a function draw for actually checking what is in those radial buttons. So here, if the radio canvas button selected is specified canvas size, then we're going to say that the windowed canvas is false. Otherwise, the windowed canvas is going to be true. Now, going to the main sketch, there's two parts for the canvas. There's creating the canvas in setup. And then in the new art section, there's a resize canvas. So if the windowed canvas is true, it's going to resize the canvas based on the window size. And the 110, this is increased from before because of the UI. And if the window canvas is false, then we're going to resize based on these variables, canvw and canvh. And going back to the UI, up in the setup area for these buttons and such, uh, in the window input, the, uh, there's an input that calls w change for width change. And there's another one in here for height change. And then if we go down to that, uh, if window change is called, then canvw is be going to become the number of this value. So that means whatever the user put in the width field is going to become the canvas width. Then back to the draw area, if the radio layers value is zero, then layers is going to be true. If radio layers value is one, then layers is false. Otherwise, if radio layers value is two, then that means random has been selected. So now we have a 50% chance that layers is going to be true or layers is going to be false. And then we do the exact same thing with the tree, whether add tree is going to be true or false. And the same thing with the circles, whether add circles is going to be true or false. And then with radio shape and radio size, we're actually going to be using the numbers 0 through 3. And those were strings, so we're going to be converting it to a number using this number function. And that's how we're going to get numbers for the shape type or the scale select. I want to thank Artilus on the Coding Train Discord for giving me some pointers on the radio buttons. Now the final thing to talk about is the grain. You can see in this grain button, this is going to call the add grain function. That is on the main sketch all the way at the bottom. And what the add grain function does is it loads the pixels. So we've got a nested loop for the width and the height. Um, hopefully you know about loading pixels. We're going to take the existing pixel color. So we've got a location on the canvas and we're going to get the red pixel, the blue pixel, and the green pixel. And I'm either adding or subtracting from that red value. Pix vary I've got set at 20. So in other words, if we found that the red was 100, uh, we might be adding 20 and wind up with 120, or we might be subtracting 20 and wind up with 80 or anywhere in between. And then we're replacing that pixel with the new red value. And we do the same thing for blue and green, and then we update our pixels. I should add that this graininess was suggested to me by Mutt on Twitter. I will add a link to Mutt's Twitter in the video description. So I believe that covers all the th different things that I've done. Uh, it's possible there are a couple of other tweaks in here that I've forgotten about. As you can imagine, I'm pretty happy with how this thing turned out. Kind of amazed that it does some of the things it does. If you've liked this video, please give it a like. Consider subscribing to the channel. Ring the bell for notifications. Comments, I love to read your comments. Please share this with friends. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Steve's Makerspace.